in preparation for the word this morning when we bow, bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, we thank and praise you for this day as this is the day you have made, Lord. We thank you that we can come and worship you, that uh, your spirit is here, Lord, to open our hearts and minds to your word as well. To you belongs our glory, honor, and praise. And so we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning I wanted to continue with part two on the Bible as uh, this is the second in the series, part one and two, and Pastor Dave will be back next week, so I thank you for the opportunity to fill in for him as he's been on vacation and also tending to some other duties. This is a story I want to open with from a guide post by Ray Ann, posted on February 25th, 2021. Three-year-old Jonah was all tucked in ready for bedtime and tonight, the mom decided a story would come from the Bible. I told Jonah about Samuel, a little boy like himself, who lived in the temple with the priest, Eli. One night, Eli lay down to sleep, and Samuel heard someone call his name. And he ran over to Eli and said, Oh, here I am. When the story was over, um, or Eli was not the one who called Samuel's name, the mom explained to Jonah but it was the Lord. So when the story was over, we spoke about Samuel and how God speaks even to little boys. I thought it might be fun to talk about what God's voice might sound like. So I asked little Jonah, have you ever heard the voice of God? Well, yes, he said without hesitation, the day I got run over by the truck. Incredible here. I was stunned, of course. I remembered the day he was talking about. I would never forget it. It was only a few months earlier. It seemed like only yesterday that the doctor had finally removed the cast from his leg. My husband Wade had driven his truck to work that day and I was at home doing the dishes when I heard Wade pull in because he came back from work because he had forgotten something. He jumped out of the truck, ran into the house, grabbed it, ran back, and I returned to doing the dishes. Wade backed out, the tires crunching over the crushed shells in the driveway. Then I heard a terrible scream. Wade, I thought. He ran back into the house carrying little Jonah in his arms. When, at Jonah, when Jonah went inside, a black tire mark showed on one of his legs. Oh, I was backing out, Wade said. I turned out into the street and looked back. Jonah was curled up on the ground and I ran over to him. We put Jonah on the couch, called 911, paramedics, firemen, EMT came and they checked him out. Finally, the EMT looked at me and said those words, he's going to be fine. Oh, we praised God, thank you God. We took him to the hospital for a full examination. He had a small fracture above his knee and would have to wear a cast for six weeks, but he had sustained no internal injuries. Wherever he was, I never saw him at all from behind the wheel, Wade said. He must have run up beside me as I went out. The police think the, that the truck, or he just graced the side of the truck. Jonah had been through so much that we didn't want to upset him with a lot of questions after the event. At three years old, he probably couldn't really tell us what happened exactly anyway. But as I was putting him to bed one night with his leg in a cast, he asked me, Mommy, why does Daddy have a tire under his truck? Interesting. That's a spare tire, I started to explain. In case Dad, and I trailed off realizing what Jonah's question meant, he had never seen the tire before because it could only be seen from underneath the truck. And then Jonah went on to say, if it had been a few, or, or if the tire, first of all, had been just a few inches further down the driveway, Wade said I would have run him over. But Jonah, as we come to find out, was hanging on to the back of the truck, and he was looking at the tire as Dad was backing out. Neither of us could bear to think of what could have happened. But at the church, the following Sunday, Easter weekend, we felt as if we had our own little miracle. We accepted that we may never know exactly what had happened, but now after the bedtime story about young Samuel, Jonah was giving some of the details. God spoke to you that day, I said. I was trying to climb up on the back of Daddy's truck, he said, like a garbage man. The truck started moving. I fell off, but I held on to the bumper. There Jonah was gripping the bumper, going backwards. There was no way that Wade could see him. That's when I heard, matter-of-factly, Jonah said, let go. A voice Jonah heard 
said, let go. And what happened is Jonah's hanging there. He let go. The truck backed out at an angle on the story. The wheels missed him, and uh, that saved his life. But that voice, interesting, let go. I want to share that in terms of our series on the Bible. God had spoken to little Jonah. Incredible. A real-life story about God from who? A three-year-old. A three-year-old. It's amazing how God uses what some people will say are the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. Some think young children are foolish. But really? No. Many times young children we know are innocent and speak the truth, right? There's no uh, filtering sometimes things because this is the way it is. God can work through them in mighty ways, just like Jonah here in terms of sparing this youngster's life. And God continues to carry out his mighty will and purposes, his present and insight for our lives by way of his wonderful and eternal word. What's amazing in the story, too, that that mom was concerned for her children, concerned in the Christian way, that the mom wanted to read a Bible, to share Bible stories with her children, that mom was not afraid of the Bible. She was obviously a Christian, a follower of Jesus, who wanted her kids to know about God and Jesus and Scripture. And so parents and grandparents and great-grandparents as well, and family and friends, it's so important that we share those Bible studies with those whom we love. For God has given us his word to help us, help us and others along the path of life. And so God is real. He's alive and knows what's going on in the world and all the chaos that's going on we hear in the news these days. He also knows how you and I are doing too. For the Bible reveals to us that God knows everything. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. And that everyone is precious in his sight. The Bible tells us that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That's a wonderful blessing from God. We are not accidents. We are loved and wonderfully made by God with our, all our talents and, and personalities and our thoughts. We are loved by God. Even the hairs of our heads are numbered. And we know that because why? The Bible tells me so. God said it and I believe it and that makes all the difference. And so God loves us and wants us to live our lives with his wisdom, with his word planted deep in our hearts. The Bible says in the Psalms, you ever read the Psalms? They're great scriptures of meditation and prayer and devotion. Take a Psalm uh, maybe during the week and just spend five minutes, ten minutes and read it. You can get the feel of that person that was writing them. Many of them written by David. And David was sad at times. David was happy at times. David was lamenting. David was in need. David was praising God. But it gives you the flavor of that individual and his relationship, his walk with the Lord. In Psalm 109, it says, But you, O God, my Lord, deal on my behalf for your name's sake, because your steadfast love is good. Deliver me. That's a great prayer. 1 John 4, 8, we know the characteristic of God. God is love. 1 John 4, 8, that's that agape, purest form of love. That's the type of love Ephesians talks about in husbands and wives and their relationship to one another. Do you agape your spouse? That's a great love. Research that. Study that in the Word. God expresses His love like this. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us. And he sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. God's love is a powerful love. And the Bible is an extraordinary book because it reveals that love in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's all about God's plan to save us from sin and death and the devil. The Bible tells us, too, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. That's why one day, folks, all of us will breathe our last and we will die. But that's why also we know that as a Christian, we have hope. Because we know what it means to go through the exit of death to the glory of the Lord in paradise. 
And that's the Christian hope. That's one of the Christian's joy. But our sin that causes death, the wages of sin, is death. That we know began in the Garden of Eden, and it keeps us separated from a holy and righteous God. God is perfect, but there is no sin or unholiness with Him. And that's why we know we're separated, because we can't even stand in God's presence. Remember uh, in Scripture, whenever manifestations of God would happen or Moses would stand before God, he could barely take it because God is so holy and perfect, folks, that that sin just draws us, drives us away. God is perfectly holy. There is no sin or darkness in him. And so we are in need of God to help us. And that's what we talk about. That's what we experience. That's what we um, teach in terms of our Christian faith. That with God, coming to God through Jesus Christ, there is forgiveness for our sins. There is restoration, as we heard in the song. And there is help to overcome our sin. For God transforms us from that old man and brings that new man upon us. And there is stability and strength and hope for our lives. And he does that through Jesus, his son. The sacrificial lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And we know that great verse, we hear it a lot in our communion preparation, for God so loved the world that what? He gave. That whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. And thank you, Lord, for that. So the Bible is about God's plan to save us by believing in Jesus Christ, who was born into our world, grew up under Joseph and Mary, who taught him, and I'm sure he taught them many things, too who did many signs and wonders revealing to all that he is the one and only who has the power to defeat sin, death, and the devil. Some will say, too, as they are trying to grasp the reality of Christianity, as they're trying to understand God and the Bible, some will say, of course, that phrase, how do you know God is, we is real? I don't feel his closeness. I don't know if that's true. But isn't it there we refer them to the great book, the Bible? Because there is strength right there. The Bible is full of what we need to know about God. It's God's book of love and wisdom for our lives to help us now and to repair us for the life of eternity to come after we die. The Bible, we know, is very clear on the afterlife. And it promises, if you will be faithful unto death, I will give you what? The crown the crown of life. So continue to be faithful unto death and you will receive the crown of life. I brought this little book with me again today because there's some great wisdom in here. I have one little short quote about the Bible from Luther the Reformer. Oh, how great and glorious thing it is to have before one the word of God. With that, we may at all times feel joyous and secure. We need never be in one of consolation for we see before us, in all its brightness, the pure and right way. He who loses sight of the word of God falls into despair. Have you ever noticed that in your own personal devotional life? There's times where you're just into it, and then there's times you drop off, drop away. And then sometimes your life gets more chaotic and pressured, and you realize, oh, i got to get back to the word. I've got to get back to worship. I need that strength. That's what he's talking about. He who loses sight of the word of God falls into despair. The voice of heaven no longer sustains him. He follows only the disorderly tendency of his heart and of world vanity. If you're only feeding your mind with the news today or with what society feeds you, we're not going to be happy, folks, because there's a lot of darkness in the world. But that's where we flee to the, the word of God. We flee to God for strength. Because he said, he said, never will I leave you nor forsake you. And he said also, in this world you will have trouble, but what? Take heart. I have overcome the world. So that's the strength we find through our relationship with him and through his word that can be trusted. Because it's no ordinary book. The Bible is different from the novels you read or the stories you see. It's been tested and tried. It's been dissected and analyzed. If you have questions about the, book, the Bible, uh, go and look up Lee Strobel. He's got great books on faith, on the Bible, and how we know it's true. 
Have an open mind, open heart, study it. Even read it to see his journey, where he comes from, from not believing God to faith. It's great. Some have challenged the Bible, called it mythical or old-fashioned. You know, that was for those, not for me today, but we know the Bible is alive and active. It pierces us deep in the heart. That's what Jesus is talking about in these readings. The Bible, Jesus, he wants our heart, not just this up here, our intellect. So the Bible has a place no other book holds. And it comes from God. And that's one of the reasons it is so important. It is God breathed. Second Timothy 3.16. You can't talk about scripture. You can't talk about this one year Bible or the Bible without knowing it's God breathed. That's what's so special. I brought this. This was a Christmas gift. And uh, if you've never read the Bible in a year, there you go. These are out there. They're study Bibles. You know that as you've been in the faith a while. But for some of those, some of you who uh, maybe want to read the Bible in a year, there's a Bible for you. 2 Timothy 3.16, for all Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for what? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the person of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So let's think about this inspired by God. That's an incredible thing. That means God helped the writers write it. All scripture is inspired by God for teaching the truth. There is so much false, fake news out there, even regarding the Bible, even regarding God. We have to go to scripture. What is the truth? And you will be blessed by that. For rebuking error. When some say, oh, the, uh, there's many ways to heaven, you can just, you know, get there on your own. We know that that's false. Or some say you have to work your way to heaven. No, no, there's no salvation there because then that means you're doing it. The only salvation, the truth of Scripture, comes by way of faith in Jesus. And that's why he's up there on that nice mural, that stained glass window, the way, the truth, and the life to remind us that this is what we're all about. Also, it's for correcting faults, showing our sins so that then we flee to God, confess our sins that we do in worship, and we receive that forgiveness also in the sacrament, and for also giving instruction for right living. Wrong living is out there. That's the easy path. There's plenty of ways to live wrongly, and Jesus says there's right living, and so may he help us do that. So when reading and studying the Bible, it is so very important to know that God is behind all of it, that God helped the writers to write it, that God moved in their hearts and minds to record everything he wanted the world to know. And so we call that divine inspiration. When I was uh, ordained a minister, we had to have a, make a pledge, an oath, to be committed to Scripture, to be committed to God's Word. If we aren't committed... Why are we a minister? So this is very important. The inspired, inerrant, authoritative word of God. I believe it. And I thank God for it. When a person becomes a follower of Jesus Christ, they have to, when they take on the name Christian, Jesus is not only their Savior and Lord, but the word also becomes their instruction manual. Jesus says in John 17, 17, Thy word is truth. It's part of what... Jesus uh, prays that high priestly prayer in John 17. Here he prays for his followers as he's going to be going to the cross and Calvary. He prays for his followers to God the Father and says, I send them into the world. We've been sent. Dedicate them to yourself by means of the truth. And your word is truth. So as God sent his disciples in, he sends us today with his word that this church is based upon the word of his truth. So the word is vital. It's essential to who we are as a Christian people being divinely inspired. What do we know about the Bible? Well, written over 1,500, 1,600 years, right? How many different authors? Anybody know? Oh, I know something you don't know. <laughs> Remember that movie? What was that line in? Um, National Treasure. That was hilarious, that line. But the Bible is written by over 40 authors. 
40 authors and over that 1500, 1600 span of time, it comes together, together in a very orderly fashion that starts from creation all the way through Jesus, the death, the crucifixion, the resurrection, then all the way to Revelation, the end, the Alpha and the Omega. Everything you need to know, folks, is right here. And so we celebrate that. We read it. We thank God for it. It has an incredible unity that shows God's plan for you and for me. So thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for that plan. That is incredible. In 2 Peter chapter 1, we have this uh, in terms of the scriptures being inspired by God. Some of you probably know this. We have the word of the prophets made more certain. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place. And the world is a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So that is divine uh, inspiration. The Holy Spirit worked through men's minds and hearts to record what God wanted them to know. And that is important. They were carried along to communicate what God wants, his light in the midst of darkness. We think about that darkness and how important it is that God light, God's light shines. And yes, churches are so very important in terms of our nation. The light of God shines through churches and Christian people. The Bible says, blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord. Because there is light, there is peace, there is hope for the world. God is with us, and we can open our Bible and read it and meditate upon his awesome and powerful word. Think what a blessing that is in America, folks. It's one of our foundational constitutional rights, freedom of religion, that we don't have to be like Afghanistan now. What a mess that is. What darkness. Our prayers, my heart goes out to those that, where was the plan in that? Just created chaos. But some believe that uh, in a crisis, there's opportunity. So keep creating crises so that then we can have the opportunity to fix it. Wow, that's kind of backwards thinking for me. But here in Scripture, or we can have Scripture on our Bible apps on the phone. But you read about Afghanistan, right? The Taliban? Oh, if you have it on your phone, you're gone. They will, they will take you away right away. So in America, we protect that. In the Western world, Western civilization, we protect that as well because we know the importance of that. The Bible, we can open our Bible and read and study upon his awesome and powerful word where he speaks his truth to us, where he instructs us in godly wisdom. Like Philippians 4, do not be anxious about anything, but by all prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So we're praying for Afghanistan. We're praying for people here around the world. God calls us to pray for all people. And we know that he is all powerful and hears our prayers. And he transforms nations. He transforms lives as faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the question today is, do you want more faith? Well, look at the Word of God. It gives faith. It's an awesome tool of God. For the Bible is trustworthy. It's truth for our lives. And it transforms our hearts and minds from light, or from darkness to light, to be more Christ-like. May God bless us in that transformation that's ongoing throughout our lives as we humble ourselves before His Word, as we read it and study it. And then our lives are blessed by it. In Jesus' name, amen. May, may we pray. Lord God, we gather here as your people to worship you, to hear your word. And we thank you, Lord, for your awesome Bible. That book of light in the darkness. That book of strength. That book of hope, Lord. That book of peace that passes all understanding as it points us to Jesus Christ. Thank you for the many teachings in there, Lord the many lessons to learn and apply in our lives. 
Thank you for the inspiration that it's divinely given by you, Lord, through many people like us, sinners, but yet who were used mightily to your glory and honor. Thank you, Lord. May your Holy Spirit open our hearts and minds to be eager to study, to read that word on a daily basis, Lord, and to be strengthened in our faith, our walk with you. Strengthened individually and strengthened together in fellowship as your church. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.